it felt like a community. That's kind of what it was. It felt like you were you were, you're finally part of a community, even if it was for five hours on a Monday night. I am Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, a podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories they created there, and the people that they used to know. Daryl Bullock is the writer of David Bowie Made Me Gay, a book that celebrates a hundred years of queer influence on popular music. He also hosts World's Worst Records on WFMU and has showcased some fine, fine tunes from the likes of William Shatner and Florence Foster Jenkins. We caught up to talk about Crackers, an otherwise straight bar in the southwestern English town of Gloucester, which held a weekly gay night on Mondays in the late 80s. The town, close to the Welsh border, has a population of around 130,000, and Crackers was the only gay-themed night for it and the surrounding towns. Gloucester in the eighties and yeah, the eighties was pretty grim. Although to be honest with you, it's even more grim now than it used to be. It's uh, you know, it was kind of I, I suppose it was something in the early industrial revolution kind of period, but it never really amounted to much. It's it's got a fantastic cathedral, really really beautiful cathedral that um, some listeners might recognise because it was used in uh, all the Harry Potter films, the cloisters in the Harry Potter films, oh, okay. the cloisters are used in the Harry Potter films. And the, the cathedral's beautiful. The docks area um, has been done up really nicely over the last kind of couple of decades. Um, but Gloucester itself is a bit of a ghost town, to be honest. Um, it's uh, The town centre used to be bustling, thriving. You cut the good markets, but, but these days most of the businesses have moved out. So it's like most provincial towns, although it's a city. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, it's coffee shops and phone shops and not a lot else anymore. Um, but in the 80s, it was, certainly while I was living there, because I, I kind of left in, and then kind of kept dipping back in and out. It was, you know, uh, pubs, McDonald's, record shops, because we still have record shops in those days. Um, those kind of places. It was. It was like. It was like any nondescript town. It could have been Swindon. It very much could have been Swindon or somewhere like that. For just a nondescript, kind of dull, slightly backwaters town. <laughs> that you're proud to call your hometown. No, not, <laughs> not in the slightest, actually. And, and, and it's, no, it's, exactly. it, I, no, I'm generally not. Um, I I don't really have any any ties to the place anymore, and, and I I'm glad I left. And and now my parents have kind of passed on. I, I feel no compunction to go back there at all. No. But, but so you were born, you were born. I was born there, okay. yeah. yeah. So. I was born there and kind of moved out here when I was 20. Um, I left in 1984, 1985, sorry, mid-1985, I left in 1985. And how old were you at that point? I would have been coming up to 20, I was still 20 at the time, okay. I was coming up to 21. And I left, in, yeah, middle of 1984. I think it was and then uh, it's kind of at that point after I'd, I'd had a little I'd tried to come out at home I'd tried to come out to my, my father and that hadn't gone well at all when I was much younger I was probably about 13, 14 when I told him didn't go well at all um, just you know didn't talk about it well, apart from the occasional row in which case he'd bring it up quite happily then but when I was 20 I moved out I moved to South Wales I moved to Chepstow initially sharing the house um, with a couple of girls there and it was kind of at that point when I decided that from then on in, I was going to be out no matter what. And anybody asked me, I was going to admit admit I was gay. And, you know, there was kind of, there was never going to be any question about my sexuality from that point. Yeah. Previous to that, I'd had a couple of very difficult years trying to tell friends. That hadn't gone well at all. Most of my friends had kind of backed away from me or had kind of had actually got quite, you know, unpleasant with me. One friend stayed with me and is still my friend today, thank God. Uh, one since then I've kind of made up with, but the rest of them, it's kind of, you know, it's just you know, a provincial backwater place I'm kind of glad to see the back of. Um, and so so you've just talked about how you were living in Chepstow. 
Yeah. But that you moved back. Why did you move back? Well, that's that's a very long... I mean, when I moved back principally, because it was a couple of years after my dad had died, my mum had become ill. Not massively ill, not debilitatingly ill, but she wasn't doing very well at the time. Um, and I wasn't doing... I was kind of struggling to maintain a mortgage on a house I'd bought. So it just seemed like a sensible thing to do was sell the house. I'd made a little bit of money on the house, and I decided to invest in my own business. So I moved back to Gloucester, started my own second-hand CD and record shop, CD shop mostly. Um, and at that point, moved back into my mother's house so I could kind of look, help look after her for a while. And so, so you talked about your relationship with your dad and, and specifically in relation to your coming out. Mm. What was it like with your mum then? Well, my relationship with my dad in the last few years of his life actually got a lot better. Okay. After I moved out of house, he dealt with my being gay so much better than he had done beforehand. And actually the last three years, well, he was still alive, you know, I would have been away two, three years before he died. And we got on very well at that period. He was okay and he was actually helping buy the house when he died. So we were getting on okay. Um, do you know why that shift? Um, I think I think I think the issue with my dad was I told him when I was very very young. I was I was I really was thirteen fourteen years old when I told my dad, and he he just couldn't deal with it at that time. I was I, I was quite a difficult teenager. No, you? Yes, yeah, surprising, surprising, <laughs> surprisingly, I was a very difficult teenager. I was running away from home a lot. Um, I was picked up by the police a couple of times and brought back home. I was slagging off school. I, 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 I did really well up until kind of 13, 14, until, until puberty, basically. Yeah. I, did, I was doing really well at school up until that point. And then everything went haywire. Um, I'd already accepted in myself that I was gay, but trying to deal with that, you know, all, all the stuff that goes on in your head when you're dealing with your own sexuality, dealing with puberty, dealing with telling your friends, dealing with telling your family, d- everything, and dealing with being, you know, sexually attracted to someone of the same sex, yeah, everything yeah. that goes on at that point. I was struggling to cope. And although I never did anything stupid, um, I was finding my life in that town very oppressive. So I was doing anything I possibly could to get out of the place. And I did. I, you know, I, I left home at like two o'clock in the morning and tried to hitch a ride up north. And, you know, and, I, and I, I would jump on a train and just bugger off to another town and disappear for a couple of days because I just needed headspace. You know, I needed, I needed somewhere where I wasn't surrounded by this incredibly provincial, constraining, suffocating environment um and that's not really a reflection on parents they were the people they were they were the age they were you know yeah. my dad my mum and dad were in their 40s when they had me and i was the last of six kids they'd already dealt with all the you know they'd already dealt with puberty and, and everything that you know four girls and a boy go through um and then suddenly i come along you know and you know leap out the closet it was a bit too much for them i, I, I get that i don't have any issue with that i don't i don't blame them i don't okay. have a problem with my parents not or my, my, my father not being able to deal with my sexuality because that was just... We grew up in an environment where TV was full of these horribly camp men like like Danny LaRue and John Inman and, and, and Larry Grayson and all those kind of things, which, you know, names you probably wouldn't be allowed to look up. But it was. Not, 70s TV was full of suffocating camp, mincing queens. And I'm sure my dad thought, oh, my God, I've, I've raised one of those. Yeah. You know, I, 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 that boy is going to be, you know... Um, glory from it and I thought man, it must have scared the life out of him I don't know I get that I don't have an issue with that but to go back to your question I'm sorry uh, my relationship with my mum was fine we never talked about my sexuality until one day I happened to say to her I've met someone and she said oh what's his name there was never a question we never had the big out I never I never had to come out to my mother it was just she knew she knew and she was great about it She was there was never a question we did talk about it and she did say well you know I can't say I'm, you know, I'm, I'm overly happy because I do worry about what will happen to you. But there was never anything but I love you and that's all that matters for my mother. Okay. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky to have had that. There was never, there was never a kind of, you freak out of my house. It never, ever, ever, ever happened. We never had a row. We never had, we never had much of a conversation. It really was, I, I want, you know, I've met someone. Oh, what's his name? That was it. That was, that was my coming out to my mother. So we're talking about this period in the late 80s and, and having moved back and living in living yeah. with your mum. What was that like for you? Well, it was a very weird time because I was I was seeing somebody I'd been working with and living with in, in Chepstow. And around about that time, this whole group of friends that I had in Chepstow all split up for various reasons. We, did, we were all working in the same, uh, we were all working in a hotel together. Yeah. Um, you know, bars and, and restaurant and all that kind of stuff that goes on in the hotel. 
And it, around about this time, we'd all kind of fractured. My, my Phil, who is still one of my closest friends and is the father of my goddaughter, he moved off to Pastures New. Terry, the guy I was, see, I was kind of seeing, we had a very odd relationship, but I was kind of seeing him. He moved back into the valleys in South Wales because his mother had had a stroke. And I decided at that point I was going to sell the house and move back to Gloucester, start my own business, and also help to look after my mum because she had, she was suffering quite badly with sciatica and that kind of stuff. Um, and it was fine, you know. Uh, I was kind of, I was very involved in in this new business. I was trying to get off the ground. Um, so literally it was just somewhere to, put, somewhere to you know, sleep at night and somewhere to eat a meal. And that was kind of it. I had no friends in Gloucester because they'd all moved on or I'd fallen out with them the yeah. years before when I lived there. And I didn't really care about that because I had friends in Wales and other parts of the country I was in touch with. Terry and I would see each other at, at most weekends. Um, you know, I'd, or I'd quite often I'd, I'd jump in the car on a Saturday night and drive down to see him, spend, you know, Saturday night and Sunday with him and drive back so I could up at the shop again on Monday kind of thing. And then I got a job in, I was offered a job in Cheltenham um, running a record shop. So I had this little business my own. It wasn't working out. Cut a very long story short, I closed that down. I was offered a job running a shop in Cheltenham. Uh, and I took that and at that point made a whole bunch of new friends. Still living in Gloucester, commuting, something like 10 miles. Uh, so driving backwards and forwards or, or, or whatever. And I met a whole bunch of new people and spent four really, really happy years living in that area, having a whale of a time. Which brings us to crackers. Yo. <laughs> crackers! So, uh, so, so I guess we need to say crackers wasn't a gay bar, but it had a gay night. Yeah, it was uh, It was an old nightclub, which uh, was underneath the car park, the NCP car park at the back of Gloucester bus station. And it had, it had been known in my youth, I'm sure I had a name before that, as Tracy's, what a great name for a nightclub. Tracy's nightclub. Um, but I digress. So it was a nightclub in the back of the bus station underneath the car park, underneath this huge NCP car park. It was originally called Traces. Then it changed hands and the people that owned it decided to um, to run theme nights. So every night was something different. So kind of weekends was kind of a, a, a usual kind of 80s club. Mm-hmm. So, you know, lots of guys in mullets and, and girls in rah skirts, whatever they were wearing, you know, yeah. in those days. But during the week, Monday night was gay night. Monday night was gay night. And um, there was no gay life in Gloucester at all. Um, there were a couple of pubs which were known to be kind of accommodating, but there was no gay pub as such. Yeah. So Crackers was the only place to go. And it was a Monday night. And a friend of mine uh, called Mervyn, he used to run a monthly gay disco over at uh, Cheltenham Racecourse. And he took over running crackers on running the club night on a Monday night in crackers. So that's how it kind of came about. Okay. So, so, and so I find it really useful to visualise mm-hmm. places. So sure. behind the bus, it's behind the bus, behind station. The station. you, on you the main go road. through the door, it's on the main road. It's on the main road. You know, you drive past it, you know, and you wouldn't know. What, what was it like? You go through the front door, what happens? Gosh, I'll go back. So you go through the front doors, you know, kind of swing doors, front doors, and you kind of immediately into a kind of um, ticket come cloaky room kind of yeah. area. And, and this is this is the eighties, so it's so it's grey and red carpet. You know, it's kind of it's grey carpet with red streaks in, and you know, and and you go through there, and you go through more swing doors, a bit like going into a bloody theatre in a hospital, into the club itself. So very small kind of ante room, which is your, your cloak room and, and and tickets place, I guess. And you're straight into the club. And the club itself, it's kind of, a, it, it's in a circle. So it, around the circle, you've got, I have a feeling, thinking about it, there were two bars, but there might have been a bar at either side, or there might be just one, and I'm misremembering it. But you go in, and there'd be a bar, and your, your, your toilets were on the same kind of level as the bar. It was a one room. It was one, you know, one room on one floor. And then you go down two or three steps into the dance floor area, oh, which was okay. in the middle of the room so itself. So people can circle around yeah. and watch you on the dance yeah. floor. Yeah. Okay. So you had you had almost like a natural meat rack area. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So so on the on the level as you come through the doors, you probably got a, a space maybe six foot to yeah, all around the room. And and windows. Were there windows? No. So it was like, okay. Yeah. Proper dingy. Yeah, no, it's it's you're you're under a car park. You are you're on the ground floor. You're you're kind of under a car park. There's, okay. there's no there's no there's no windows out into anything there. No. Okay. No, it's it's light and it's sweaty and people smoked in in those days indoors. Oh, of course, yeah. So it stank. 
yeah. of cigarettes and alcohol. It really did. It was, it was, the carpet was sticky and, you know, everything smelled of cigarettes and, and alcohol and on the Monday poppers, of course, you know, <laughs> uh, stack of poppers. So, oh, that's interesting. So on the dance floor, people were taking poppers. Oh, or... gotcha. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Things, things were a lot freer at that point. So, you know, we didn't have to worry about poppers and, and smoke. Everyone, everyone was, people were smoking the cigarettes and people would dance with a cigarette in their hand, you know. You, you kind of didn't dare kind of, you know, um, I, I don't know, uh, flaunt yourself too much. You probably end up getting burnt by somebody's straight cigarette, you know, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. But you know, that's kind of the way things things happened in those days. You dance around with, probably with a, you know, with a warm lager in one hand and a cigarette in the other. Oh, right, but yeah. And, and your bottle of pop is in your shirt pocket. And, and a bottle yeah. of pop is in your shirt pocket. So you were in the middle of telling me about Mer- Marvin? Mer- Mervin. Mer- so Merv, Mervin. Merv ran, ran the gay night. He yeah. ran crackers on a Monday night and it was him and then we had a DJ Dougie, who everybody called Dougay. <laughs> Dougay, bless him. <laughs> D-U-G-A-Y, Dougay. I think it was Dougie, DJ Dougie. He's probably, I don't know if he's still around a lot. Merv is, is in Bristol. Uh, I see him. I, I, I saw him quite a lot when I, I used to pub. I used to drink him until reasonably recently. Uh, we were both regulars there, so I used to see him quite a lot. We'd kind of reminisce about the old days. He's a lovely, lovely, lovely guy. Um, but he was, you know, he kind of kept things in order. There was never any trouble. There was never any trouble. And... Kind of because of where it was, because it was a little off the main drag, you never had any grief there. You never you could come outside and you wouldn't kind of worry too much okay. about about bumping into anybody or getting your head kicked in or anything like that. I would flirt with guys at, at crackers on a Monday night. And one or two, once or twice I got picked up and once or twice I got into very strange scenes, which I or, or almost got involved in strange scenes because I didn't quite know what was going on. But that would never have happened in my work environment. You know, I would never have gone out looking for guys or the looking for sex or anything like that. But certainly you'd go on a Monday night and if I was if I was with Terry, for example, although I was hoping I'd end up in bed with him when we got home, that might not necessarily happen because he was a bit more free and easy with his yeah. idea of what a relationship should be than I was. Um, so I kind of learned how to read the signals there, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I, le- I learned eye contact. I learned the look, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I hadn't, previously had the chance to learn that so so it was where I kind of it's where I got to recognize the nod where I got to recognize that being clocked as we used to call it I've been clocked so I don't know if you I don't know if, if the kids use that phrase either, but, oh, he's, <laughs> well say he's thinking I'm one yeah. of the kids but yeah so, so I've been clocked so it means basically somebody, yeah, yeah. somebody's caught you somebody's looking at you and they they you know they want to get to know you a little bit better there was definitely a sense of as I said release but also a kind of understanding that if I was dealing with sexual frustration, I could hopefully find an outlet. Store up yeah. until Monday night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> you, you can wait till Monday, can't you? You can wait till Monday. Um, and I did. I met some very interesting people there, and, and um, I, I made some interesting discoveries, and I found out what certain words meant that I hadn't become aware of before, and so like that, you know. <laughs> do, we, do we have examples of those Well, no, the, the one that sticks in my mind is I, I was with... I was with uh, the guy I was seeing at the time, Terry, and um, he was a few years older than me and uh, much more worldly wise and had been around quite a bit and had been, you know, in long term relationships before. So, and so, just by a few years old, do you mean? Uh, he, he was oh, probably about 13 years older than me. Okay. And um, I was besotted with him, but it was never going to go anywhere. It was just, it was very much kind of, as far as he was concerned, this was casual. Uh, we were friends, and I, and I get that. But I was, I was, I was younger. I was much more impressionable. I, I was, I was in love as far as I was concerned. <laughs> but yeah, I was, I was, I was in there one night, and I, I'd kind of, I just bought some new kind of oxblood red Dr. Martins. I was wearing these. I was wearing. Je- I don't wear jeans very often, especially not now. But so I'm too fat. But I, I had a pair of jeans on and a pair of Dr. Martins on, and I think a polo shirt. And I, I thought I, I could look quite smart for for the you know. For the, for the day and I was at the bar getting drinks in and this guy in a very very kind of cute I'd say cute these days but you know a bald guy um, leather jacket turned around to me and sort of looked me up and down and goes um, what do you know about boot polishing and I, I just didn't have the slightest idea what he was talking about so I kind of giggled in a kind of coquettish kind of way and went back to, to the table and left Terry and gave him his gin and tonic and something with my pint of beer and I said, I said, I think that somebody wants to kick my head here. I said, he said, what do you mean? He said, well, this guy's just asked me what I know about boot polishing or polishing his boots or something. I think he wants to hit me. And Terry spat gin across the table into my face because he was laughing so much. And apparently it was him asking me if I'd be his slave for the mice. 
And then he came up to me and kind of whispered in my ear, I'll see you outside in 10 minutes. And I'm like, oh, shit. Shit, I don't know. What, uh, I'm really sorry, but I completely misunderstood what you're saying. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. No, no, no. We're, we're together. That's it. Fine. And he and he went off quite happily. It was no. But yeah, that kind of thing. You know, I'd never come across that kind of remote kind okay, of essence, yeah. remote kind of you know fetishy thing beforehand. Yeah, that was my first experience of any kind of you know leather daddy S and M kind of thing ever. You know, apart from you know stuff I'd seen on TV and fantasised about, I'd never ever been. What, did, what was on TV at that time that was? Well, no, I'm, I'm thinking. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm just thinking if I had seen anything, it would have been. You know, there's, okay. You know, <laughs> I, so so that was that was kind of that was funny, um, but it was um, yeah, it was an eye opening time. Um, are we able to talk about Terry some more? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, he's dead now, so we can talk away. <laughs> He Sorry, I don't know why I laughed. Ah, he um, went like dead. <laughs> so you talked before about Terry being a bit freer and looser with yeah. his loving. Well, I I met him um, when I started working at this hotel in Chepstow. He was he was actually my boss, and he was very uh, loush, loush, loush. I think is the correct word, isn't it? He's very loose, very kind of very open about his sexuality and stuff like that. And very funny, really, really funny guy liked to drink he was he was he he'd like to drink a lot we got I, I just i was smitten by him and then shortly after i'd started working at the hotel I, I was buying this house and he needed someone to stay because he split up with his boyfriend of 11 or 12 years his partner so he ended up moving in with me and although we didn't share a bedroom we lived together and we kind of slept together occasionally his attitude was set to sex was kind of like or to to meeting people was like he he'd tap anything he'd have the chance to there was never any kind of um, idea of exclusivity with yeah. him or anything like that. And, and we never, you know, in all fairness, anything I project onto that was my own naivety and my own stupidity, I suppose. But I kind of, I, I had it in my head that we could be a couple because, you know, I was I was younger. I was, I'd, n- I'd never slept with him before I slept with him. Ah. He was the first guy I'd ever slept with. So and that, and I was I was 21, even though I'd yeah. been out. I'd, I'd never actually slept with a, a, a guy I had a you know a little kind of fumble hand shandy that kind of stuff, but I'd never actually slept with a guy until I slept with Terry. And so I was kind of a bit smitten uh, and projecting far too much onto that. But yeah, he was also about thirteen years older. He was kind of he was out of a relationship, so he didn't want, really want to get back into one. Clearly. And then so so in terms of the dynamic, because I mm. think most of us have probably been in one of those situations where we are smitten by someone who. Is giving us all the signals that it's probably they probably don't want the same thing from us that we want from them. Sure, um, but but we pursue it anyway. What was the dynamic like? And when you were out and he was hitting on other people, what was your response? Oh, I was terrible. I was terrible. I got really. I used to get incredibly jealous. And 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 yeah, I I I, 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 I'm I'm a terrible one for for throwing things. I'm not like as bad. physically throwing yeah 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 I'm not, as bad. I'm not as bad as I used to be but I've 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 threw a glass at his head once oh god you're sitting here like a towel yeah yeah don't worry don't worry I, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't throw things anymore I'm a much I'm a mature man in my mid fifties now I don't do things like that but I, I was a terrible one I was I was a, I was a plate smasher I was a thrower oh wow I actually I threw a crystal glass at his head once yeah uh, <laughs> and, and you connected. Hmm? No, 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 no! Okay. I missed. I missed. Thank God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I was. I was a terrible one. I was a terrible one for throwing fits and tantrums. I, I really did. I, okay. I, I, again, you know, it's 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 new for me. I'm going through all yeah, the kind yeah. of that that angst and rage that you go through when you you think you're in love. I wasn't in love. I was infatuated. I wasn't in love, but I didn't know that at the time. Yeah, yeah. And I, I was a terrible one for threatening to break things and smash things and throw things and, and do all that kind of stuff. Ah. So the relationship with Terry was kind of up and down and lots of broken. It was it was very up and down and it lasted for about eleven years on and off. Oh wow! And yeah 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 yeah. It was it was a big up. We had lots of up and down times, and eventually it finished when I threw uh, when I finally had enough of what I saw as being kind of. Basically being used. I just yeah, felt, yeah. I, I felt I was kind of being used. I was kind of like I was the go-to gay kind of thing. You yeah. Know? But um, in the, in the eleven years, were, you were monogamous. No, 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 okay. no, no. So you had other. I wanted to be, but yeah. it wasn't happening. So whatever things came along, I would dally. Okay. Yes. But but like physically and not emotionally, or both. 
It was almost all physically. I was okay. very little. I mean, I was emotionally tied to Terry completely. Okay. And, 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 and if he'd have just given me the nod and said, you know, I want us to be monogamous, everything else would have gone out the window. Yeah. No yeah. interest there at all. I wasn't. I wasn't. You know, I wasn't sleeping around with every every everybody. But occasionally, yeah, sorry, I'm not, not doing no, 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 no. <laughs> but I'm trying, you know, put some. There were occasionally other people that came along, and occasionally we would have sex. But that was it. Was having sex. It really was. Yeah. It wasn't. There was nothing emotional there. Okay. I was very emotionally tied to this relationship I was having with Terry. And as that kind of petered out and it became more and more obvious that nothing was ever going to come from this, so that I started then to have more and more experiences with other people, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And 11 years, that's such a long time. Yeah, kind of. It was. Uh, was it 11 years? Maybe. Mm. I can kind of time it. I can time it. I know it was 1986 was when I bought. I kind of I started buying the house when I bought the house. That was 86. My dad died in 86. I was working at the hotel in 86, so I must have known him at that point because I was because he was my boss. So so that's 1986 is the start point, and the end point was around about the time that REM's New Adventures in Hi-Fi came out. So I think that's. Time. I think if I remember correctly, that's. 1998 it might be 97 because I know it was after Monster because that's 1995 I went to see that with him live <laughs> and it was about the time the Adventures in Hi-Fi came out because I went down to visit him and he was at this point in uh, he'd gone back as a mature student to university and I was visiting him in his digs at uni and I'd taken a copy of New Adventures in Hi-Fi with me to give to him so he was we both loved R.E.M. And we had a massive blistering fight that night. And even though I was very drunk, I stormed out of the flat and I never saw him again from that day. Ever again? No. Oh, I wow. spoke to him once on the phone about 10 years later. Oh, wow. I never saw him again after that day. Massive, massive, massive fight. And that was it. And that was it. That was at that point. So I can't do this anymore. You, this, every time we get together, we just get drunk and we fight. And I can't do it anymore. I need to save my own sanity. And I walked out and I never saw him again. Oh, wow. So we talked a lot about Terry, and every time we start talking about Mervyn, we change the subject. So Merv, tell yeah. me about Merv. I can't really tell you much about Merv. He's a lovely bloke. He's still alive. He's living in Bristol. He's, um, you know, got by got by through charm. Uh, okay. You know, he was he knew everybody, and it was always and he's all, and he still is to this day always absolutely lovely to everybody. He's very he's very good at building relationships, and those relationships stay with him for a long time. He's, he's He's much loved because he's very, very easy going, very loyal. So shall we talk about Doogie? Oh, Doogie the DJ. Dougie. Dougie, Dougie the DJ. Sorry. Dougie. We should just call him Dougay. Dougay. He used to spell his name D-U-G-A-Y. Doogie. Do, no, D-U-G-E-Y. I can't remember. It was too long ago. But but it was always... It, he didn't spell Dougie and D-U-double-G, as you kind of think of. It was D-U-G, Doug, A. But... We always used to call him Dugay. So, Dugay. So, so Dugay was very, you know, he was kind of um, your typical 80s DJ, kind of blonde mullet. Um, and any songs that stick in your mind that you would play? No, I, I, kind, of, I kind of remember the, the kind of the obvious forefillers of that time. It was always, you know, it was always It's Raining Men, and, you know, those kind of things. It was lots of high energy stuff, wasn't it, at that, that, that point? Yeah. So it was lots of Hazel Dean. It was very into his high energy stuff. So it was, so it was Hazel Dean. And I, I guess we might be talking about Sunita in that kind of period. <laughs> there was nothing. It was nothing. This this guy, he was he, he was great. He was he was he was good at what he did. He was he was. He, this is not one of your superstar DJs mixing you know mixing records and doing his yeah, own yeah. thing. And this, this isn't this isn't you know high five shooting on one forty five like after another. Yeah, this yeah. is it. Basically, is exactly what it is. Yeah. It really is. It's kind of oh, and here comes another hit from you know. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, yeah, here comes a, and it really was. It was very much a provincial DJ. You know, it's it, but but playing kind of high energy. I suppose what you what you call kind of you know handbag cheesy kind of sounds yeah. to fill the floor because you know a lot of people who went to that club didn't just come from Gloucester; they were coming from all over. Mm. And when I went back there many years later, when I was living in I was living in Bath at this point, we went with a busload of people up from uh, Bath's then gay pub, the Bath Tav. We took a coachload of people all the way to Gloucester to go clubbing for the night. That's really interesting. So there was no, there was nothing in Bath that, no. that was the same. You had, you but had, Bath is bigger than Gloucester. No, Bath is more than Gloucester. Oh, it's okay. got roughly around now. It sounds like roughly the same kind of population, uh-huh. but it's a smaller town than Gloucester, much smaller. But and and so again, sorry, my geography is no. rubbish. Bath is Bath not closer to Bristol than much. it is to Gloucester. Yeah. Much. Okay. So why then? 
I, oh, the reason we did we, re- we took a coach load of people up to Gloucester is because I was from Gloucester. My friend Annie, who ran a pub in Bath called the White Hart, we used to drink regularly at the Bath Tap, which was Bath's gay bar at the time. And we thought it'd be fun to put a, get a coach load of people together oh, and okay. go to Gloucester. Like, it's just because we were from Gloucester. Yeah, yeah. That was kind of how Annie and I became friends in Bath because we were both associated with Gloucester. Oh, okay. And we used to drink at the tap. We had lots of friends there. And it just seemed like a fun thing to do one night to get oh, a coach okay. up together and go up to invade crackers. And that's what we did. And I met this guy there. <laughs> there we go again. I met a guy there called George who was a huge big big guy called George and we kind of hit it off immediately that night and um, I invited him to come down to see me in Bath and he did and so that's probably post Terry yeah or maybe the end of Terry and we kind of started seeing each other for a while that was a really weird relationship he turned out to be a drag queen uh, I didn't know he was a drag queen at first uh, he was in catering as well really weird for gay people in catering <laughs> um, George George and I met and hit it off, and he became quite infatuated with me. I was living in Bath at the time. Um, we had an interesting few months together until I found out that he was basically... Um, uh, he George had a real issue with the truth. <laughs> like, he, <didn't, laughs> he just didn't understand what the truth was. He lived in this complete fantasy world. He, he did a drag thing. He, 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 he had, his drag name was Bella, Bella Lamour, or Bella Amour. Bella Lamour, I think it was. And I remember going out one night with a bunch of his friends. He was from kind of Evesham, Worcester kind of area. And I went out with with him and a bunch of his mates one night around that kind of area. And mm. he went off to get a drink. And his friends turned around to me and said, um, so has George told you about his kids yet? And I said, yeah. Because George had told me he had two kids and the wife had the kids and he wasn't allowed to see them and all this kind of stuff. And it was causing him a lot of grief. And that's the reason we couldn't spend a lot of time together because he was broke, because he was spending all his money, you know, yeah. uh, on on kind of legal fees and stuff. So, so he told me about his kids. Yeah, he's talking about the kids, isn't he? He hasn't got any kids. It's a complete lie. <sighs> and George, George would manufacture, fabricated these kind of these really interesting things about himself to make him sound more interesting. It's so actually, he was, he was quite dull. Oh, bless. Yeah. But he, but he kind of, he, he kind of wants to make himself more interesting than it was. So yeah. So we, he manufactured these two kids and an ex-wife didn't exist. Complete bollocks. <laughs> Sorry. But so, no, it's fine. It's bollocks <laughs> yeah. 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 So um, complete nonsense. But, bless. Uh, but, and, uh, <laughs> I mean, we've kind of got yeah, we've gone off subject here. Yeah, but but you're, you're have fun were you this. relieved? Were you relieved at that point, or were you? What, to find out he was lying. Yeah, to me? yeah, because it's my age. <laughs> I'm, I'm not very good at leaving people. I kind of. Oh, I, okay. So it was my. So we've been together for about six months at that point. Kind of, you know, seeing each other quite a lot. And my aunt from the relationship was. He lied to me. <laughs> so it was a really oh, okay. easy. It was a really easy excuse not to see him anymore. Because immediately I'm thinking, oh, good, I don't have to compete with two children anymore. No, 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 no. It was my, no, I, I'm terrible. I'm. I can't deal with being lied to. I cannot deal with people who can't tell the truth. Yeah. And if you don't tell the truth, if you can't be honest with me, then there's no there's no point in even considering having any kind of relationship here. So the fact that he was lying to me was was my kind of that was like the red flag, and I I ended it immediately. Ah. I, I I got home because we were in the middle of bloody nowhere, we were in the middle of Evesham or somewhere, but I I ended it immediately afterwards. It was kind of like no 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 no, I, I can't be lied to, I cannot deal with that. And have you ever spoken to no. George? No, I don't know. No, if he's got still alive, I've got ah, no okay. idea. I've never spoken to him since. Oh. No, he's come in conversation. Funny enough, Murphy and I have had conversations. Oh, yeah, I remember Bella. I remember George. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Oh, terrible man. Couldn't, couldn't tell the truth about anything. <laughs> Bless. And I hope he's listening. Hello. <laughs> um, you kid. Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, you talked about getting a bus from Bath and coming to Gloucester to, in yeah. order to go to Krakow's, which made me think, like, on a regular Monday night, how many people that were there were not from Gloucester? So I guess when I was when I was living in Gloucester and going there... It wasn't, you know, it wasn't massively busy. I'd say it was probably, probably an absolute maximum of 100 people there, probably less, 50 to 60, 70 people. Uh It never felt empty, but it was never crushed. Yeah, yeah, okay. It was kind of, it was a nice crowd of people when you, it was, it was a healthy mix of different people, different body types, mostly gay male. Uh There were certainly 
a few women around, uh, so I assume, and I, it's very much an assumption, they were either lesbian or bisexual. I don't know that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was very much mostly gay male, mostly, yeah, probably around about 100 people. So that's okay. all. Okay. Yeah. And, then, and then so the original questionnaire is around how many of those were from Gloucester and how many well, would you say? I would, I would guess I would guess it was probably uh, less than 50% would be local. I think a lot would come from outside, so come down from Cheltenham maybe, or come out from the forest yeah, yeah. for the night, or probably not from Bristol, because Bristol had its own scene, of course. Bristol had a very, you know, healthy gay pub scene at that point. So, but but catchment area for Gloucester, because it's quite easy to get to on the train, so maybe from Swindon and places like that, yeah. certainly down from Cheltenham, Evesham, Worcester, that kind of way, and, and certainly the forest and from South Wales, because yeah. it's a very easy place to get to from, from on the train yeah. or on a bus. So you'd, you'd certainly bump into quite a lot of people from South Wales. Yeah, and, and that's like, yeah, it's just... I guess it's so interesting because at the top of this conversation, I was thinking about, you know, living in a small town and having that one mm. gay venue, which wasn't even a gay venue, no. had one night, but actually to live in a place where there's nothing and you have to travel mm. for however long in sure. order to get there. That's, that's, yeah. And that's kind of when I, you know, when I was living, at the time when I was living in Chepstow or when I was living in Bath, that's why we would go yeah. up to somewhere like Gloucester or later, I guess, into Bristol or... Or also, also you, you go to Cardiff or you go to Swansea yeah, yeah. because there was nothing in the little villages or the little towns you were living in. There was nothing in... You know, Bath had one gay pub and a bar, the, the green room at the Garrick, the, the Garrick's Head, which was you know, the kind of old theatre bar, which was had been gay for years, but it really was, you know, little old men in dirty max sitting at the end of the bar ogling any little boys that came in. It was vile. But it was, <laughs> it, 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 it was, it was just vile. It really was. The bath tap was... The bathtub was like home. It was amazing because you finally had a decent bar in town that was run by a gay couple that was that was full of really friendly people. Um, that was just you know everybody was happy and fun and, and open and and God it was like it was like manna from heaven having that bar there. Really was it was I, I loved that place so much I could I could live there. I spent as much time as I could in that place. Just you'd go in for a coffee and stay for half, stay for the afternoon, just to chat to people, just to be around gay people. Mm. It's bloody great, and I needed that. I so needed that, you know. So why aren't we talking about that place? Um, I, don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know because I think we. I, I don't know because crackers. I think it's funnier, <laughs> and it's weird because and it's weird because you know. Um, because it was only gay once a night and it's no longer there and oh, the bath tap's no longer there either I suppose but it's I, <laughs> well, I maybe we'll got, have to meet up again I've probably got more <laughs> story, I've got more stories about crackers I suppose because it was such an odd place to go to but it was still really important and so when you look back on that time what do you think about that version of yourself that version of Daryl um, I, 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 he, he was ridiculously naive but also didn't really care you know I, I was I, I I know I've used the word before but I really release relief and release I kind of embedded in this um the fact that there was somewhere to go that you did have that one place that 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 solace even if it was only for one night of the week um was amazing it was just just amazing to have somewhere where you could for four hours on a Monday night, five hours on a Monday night, meet people who were like you and who understood you and didn't really have all that body shaming stuff that goes on, all that kind of stuff. There was kind of, because I, I guess because it was so provincial, because it attracted people from all over the place, I wasn't really aware of the kind of, the, the the disco bunny or gym bunny kind of ethic, you know, mm. that never really happened there. Mm. As I said, when I met this guy George, then George was a huge bloke, you know, he was colossal. He was probably about probably about six four and probably about twenty stone. He was a big lad, you know, like John Goodman. Um, but there was there was no shame, if you like, in that. Not that there should be, you know, yeah, I'm a yeah. big fat bloke myself. But I've been to other gay bars and other gay clubs and other gay venues where I've actually felt I felt really out of place because I'm a larger bloke, you know. Yeah. And I, what did I never really lost that until I met, I discovered the kind of the bear scene. Yeah. So it's pre the bear scene. It was pre the bear thing happening in Britain, and it's post 
the, the AIDS and HIV crisis. Mm. Or it, that's still very much, you know, this is still early years for that. Yeah. So that's still very much in people's minds. There's still a lot of that scaredness, if there's such a word going on, that, that, yeah. the fright of, you know, of meeting people and having to be careful about having sex with them or what, and how you have sex with them, what you do with these people that you might be picking up in phone boxes. Um, so it's it's a very, very weird time when all that's happening, but it's it's a really, really comfortable environment to be. Mm. Yeah. And so so that was, um, you kind of are looking forward to that Monday night. Yeah. And, and I suppose, uh, you know, I'm absolutely projecting, so correct me if I'm, if I'm misinterpreting. Was there... Yes, there's that period in your twenties when your nightlife, the thrill of meeting people, yeah. is is far greater than it becomes because it's because it is that escape. Yeah, yeah, very much so. It was it was really really important, and it, and although other things weren't working out in my life necessarily, I had that. So I had I had um, yeah somewhere else that for a period, even if it was only for four or five hours or however long the club was open for, I felt comfortable. I felt I could relax. I could, you know, I could just, just, it, I could breathe. I could breathe. Even though, you know, the air was full of poppers and cigarette smoke. I could <laughs> breathe. I could breathe. breathe it in. Because I felt I could go into an environment like that and I could stand at the bar with a pint in my hand and not have to worry, not have to think, and not have to, and if somebody dared to give me the eye, I'll, you know, I'll follow that and if I've done it and if we get chatting and if that's into something else and if we end up having sex, fantastic. But that wasn't that wasn't it wasn't about having sex, it was about meeting people and just finding someone to relate to, someone to talk to, someone to be honest and open with. As I said, I was I was open and out at work, but you don't have those conversations yeah. with, you, with your straight work friends. Yeah. And they were my friends as well as my work friends. We they were very, very, very good and and Thank God I had them because I don't think I'd have got through life without them. But there are conversations you can't have with those people. And this was one environment, one place you could go to where you could have those conversations with people. And if all it meant was all you do is camping out for the night and being a bit of a bitchy queen and doing whatever else you needed to do, you could do it. Yeah. You know, and it didn't have to end in sex. It was a plus if it did, but it didn't have to end in sex. And quite more often than not, it didn't. You know, I, I was not, I was never that kind of promiscuous. I was always much more interested in meeting people and, and you know, forging relationships with people and and seeing how things went. I was never I was never one of those people who had to jump into bed with everybody. It just never appealed to me. And what's the thing you miss most about crackers and that period of your life? I, I, I miss the sense of wonder. Yeah. Because it was all new. Yeah. There's that, definitely. There's kind of, you know, the kind of, it's almost like, you know, Christmas Day, but a box, you know, it's uh, it's uh, ripping the paper off something. It's, um, I kind of miss that, but that's the experience you have and you go through and you move on, don't you? you know? I don't, I don't miss the person I was. I, I, I'm a, I'm a fuller, a better person today than I was then, but I probably had to, I had to have that experience to be the person I am today. Yeah. It taught me a lot. It taught me, I, I, it taught me how to be comfortable in my own skin. And that was an incredibly valuable lesson to learn, you know, how not to be ashamed of the fact that I was overweight and, you know, that I'm a big guy and I was hairy and you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't fit into that, you know, sequin hot parts look, you know, Kylie waving, you know, thing. That that was never me. And, and actually finding an environment where I didn't have to fit into that, that was really, really valuable lesson to learn. Uh, and then, you know, post that, to meeting a bunch of people in Bath at in, in, in the, the top and feeling very comfortable with those and then discovering the, the whole kind of bear scene where there's even less kind of, you know, worry about your body dysmorphia, body shaming and all those kind of things go on, which was a really, really, that's a really healthy thing for me to discover. So um, I, I, I don't miss anything about it, but I'm really glad I had it because it helped me become the person I am and it was really important to the person I am. Did you ever go to Crackers? Uh, well, if you did, I'd love to hear from you. Tell me your stories and share any photos or silly anecdotes uh, through social media. You can find me on most platforms uh, with the username K Anderson Music. And if you'd like to find out more about Daryl, including some of his questionable music taste, 
then visit his website at worldsworstrecords.blogspot.com. Lost Spaces is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I've been writing songs about queer venues and people who used to live their lives there, and we'll be releasing the songs over the next year. You can hear the first single, Well Grown Boys, playing underneath my talking right now uh, on all streaming platforms. If you like this episode, I would really, really appreciate if you could tell people about it. So either share it on your Facebook wall or write someone an email. Um, And if you're feeling particularly generous, I would really appreciate a review on the iTunes store. I'm Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. (laughs) 